good afternoon, uh, good or noon, wherever uh, you are. Uh, I'm Paul Tiffany. Those of you in the Haas community who um, had me as a professor, greetings to all of you. Hope to see you in person sometime. And anyone else, uh, the greetings are just as warm. Um, we're going to talk about Trump and his global economic policies uh, for a while. And I'll try to leave enough time for Q&A. I know that's something that I usually don't do, uh, but I'm going to make a very serious attempt to do that. If you do have questions, I think you know how to communicate them, and I'll be able to see them. And uh, again, with uh, any luck, uh, we can cover all of them. Let's begin uh, with the obvious, is that um, uh, we're in a time of change. And uh, we have a president who, how should we say, is uh, somewhat unusual. And his uh, trade policies, uh, international trade policies, are clearly a uh, rather obvious uh, digression from what we've seen in the last uh, 60, 70, 75 years, that is, since the end of uh, World War II. And a fundamental question that I want to address, is it good, bad, or uh, does it matter? Um, first, a, a little bit of information on uh, the size of the global economy that we have today. By the way, I will point out that all of these PowerPoints will be available uh, on the site. So feel free to um, <clears throat> go, if you care to, look at them uh, with more leisure uh, later on. Uh, <clears throat> The um, global economy today in purchasing power parity is about $120 trillion. Uh, growth rate, um, last year uh, it was about 3.7. Uh, the uh, IMF is projecting a 3.9% growth, so decent little uptick. Uh, both this year, what's left of it, as well as uh, next year. Um, emerging economies are projected to grow a bit faster, 4.9%. Uh, and even more in 2019, 5.1. And for the U.S., the advanced economies, uh, clearly, given the scale and size and some of the issues that we'll talk about momentarily, uh, not nearly as fast, 2.4% this year, uh, projected only 2.2 uh, next year. Uh, for the U.S., we're up to 2.9% uh, uh, this year, and the projections, uh, it'll, uh, perhaps go down 2.7. Global population, uh, about 7.3 uh, billion, uh, billion people. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> does trade matter, international trade, uh, for the American economy? Um, global trade and GDP are linked somewhat, but not so tightly that one absolutely drives the other. Uh, if you look at the chart, yeah, and you can look at it in more detail later on at your leisure. The red line <laughs> indicates uh, 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 the uh, GDP growth, and the jagged line is the um, <clears throat> growth rate of um, volume of growth of trade. And then the, uh, the triangles, the green triangles, represents the uh, ratio of trade growth to GDP. So there is some fluctuation in there, but clearly there's some linkage uh, there. Uh, if we look at since uh, 2015, the uh, international trade, merchandise trade, uh, has uh, grown. Not services, but uh, uh, physical uh, objects, physical things have grown. So there has been some growth in that. That downturn earlier was what happened in China in 2015 when they had a severe downturn, their stock market collapsed, and there were some real uh, worries about trade. Uh, <clears throat> By the way, I'm not going to have uh, lots of charts for you. This is about the last one. Again, if we look at world trade volumes, uh, <clears throat> they have moved up, but as the purple lines indicate, it has not been smooth. There is an up and down uh, feature there. Uh, one last one. If you look at some of this in the last couple of slides, there is a downtick uh, most recently. The um, <clears throat> Purchasing Manager uh, Index of New Export Orders, which has been a very good predictor, uh, just as PMI for the domestic economy, has been a very good predictor of where the economy will go. It does show that there's been somewhat of a downturn, uh, as we'll 
talk about in just a moment. A lot of this has to do with the, how shall we say, uncertainty surrounding President Trump's uh, policy, views, outbursts, tweets, whatever, on international trade. This is a busy slide. Um, let me put something into context here again, because the basic question, will the uh, American economy be hurt severely by what's going on internationally? <clears throat> The American economy is huge. And relatively speaking, the uh, international trade component is not that big. Uh, <clears throat> for the world, from 1960, about 24% of GDP came from international trade. Uh, <clears throat> most recently, it's about 56%. So that's been a pretty good increase. If we compare it to the US, in 1960, 9%. Um, uh, in 2016, 27%, we're still at the same number today. So the United States, because of the huge internal economy, is not as dependent as many other nations on international trade. And if you look a little more deeply into international trade in the U.S., it's dominated by a relatively speaking handful of large firms. If we look at S&P 500 firms, um, uh, uh, half, almost half of their revenue comes from uh, outside the U.S. Coca-Cola, uh, is one example, generates uh, over 80% of its revenue from outside the United States. The, um, uh, uh, the S&P 500 accounts for 75% of total stock market valuation, but only 17% of the U.S. workforce. What that indicates, again, their growth and profits are coming uh, to a large degree from outside the uh, U.S. rather than internally. And if we look again a little more deeply, 250 of the S&P 500 account for half of America's annual exports and 60% of imports. The top 50 S&P 500 firms generate 30% of exports, 40% of imports. What does all this say? That a relatively small percentage of American businesses are most active in the global economy. Uh, but because of their size and scale, they obviously have some impact. Uh, the US Department of Commerce for years has implored SME, small medium enterprise, become more involved. But something that those who are active in the field of international strategy talk about, the so-called liability of foreignness, there's simply a lot of uh, uh, hurdles that inhibit uh, many American smaller firms to get involved. For one thing, um, currency exchange rates. Another thing, Americans don't have language capability. Uh, another thing, uh, lots of regulations and rules that have to be uh, complied with if one goes abroad. Given the size of the American economy, many smaller firms simply say, look, it's a lot easier to obtain growth in the US rather than facing these extra hurdles of going outside. I personally think it's unfortunate. There's huge opportunity for American firms, smaller and medium size, but so far they have not availed themselves of those opportunities for the reasons that I just mentioned. Um, uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> are we dependent uh, on foreign trade then, the U.S. economy, and the answer is no. One comparison I have in the slide, you take a country like Germany, almost half of its GDP come from international trade. The U.S., uh, we're, we're blessed in many respects. If you uh, uh, look at ourselves in, in a map, uh, we're large. Um, <clears throat> we um, have incredible natural resources. Uh, California is the most um, uh, uh, agriculturally dominant state in the nation, uh, $50 billion almost from agricultural produce in California. We have gold, we have silver, we have box, well, some bauxite. We, uh, with fracking now, we're becoming one of the world's major uh, oil uh, exporters. We have so much here, uh, natural resources, that we are not as dependent as many countries on the um, international economy to maintain our standard of living and our growth. Um, will Trump's policies uh, in, in trade have a negative effect on this incredible stock market boom that uh, essentially began when uh, he took office? Let me back up one second on that. 
the boom started earlier. It started with Obama. But we've seen this huge expansion since uh, November of uh, uh, 2016. Um, that, that's a good question. Um, many are beginning to say now there might be some effect, but uh, many who devote their lives to looking at the market. But it won't happen this year. Perhaps next year it slows down. The so-called Twin Peaks set, we've seen a, a peak, a drop, then a second peak. When that has occurred in the past, unfortunately, it usually presaged a major recession. So maybe that's coming up. But will it be driven by um, uh, a um, trade policy? It's interesting, if you look at the papers today, uh, what's happened, the market has set new highs uh, uh, in almost all the uh, indexes. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, was that Trump announced this morning that Mexico <clears throat> had agreed to uh, uh, renegotiate NAFTA. I'm not familiar with the details. I don't know what that implies. Uh, <clears throat> we should keep in mind, though, Canada uh, is not part of that uh, deal. And Canada remains America's largest trade partner. So uh, good news on Mexico. <clears throat> the jury's still out on Canada. I'm, this is a slide I'm not going to spend time on. If you've had uh, any of my courses, I tend to do, uh, speak quite a bit about this. What it says in a nutshell <clears throat> is that the notion of free trade has not been popular historically. Uh, <clears throat> nations have looked out for their own self-interest. They've wanted to protect their own uh, firms, their own economic actors. And free trade, really a regime of free trade, really a globalization, if you want to call it that, began to occur <clears throat> in the uh, United Kingdom in the 18th and 19th century. And as the UK pushed forward and became the world's dominant military power and economy, it made the world safe for free trade. <clears throat> uh, but many had and continue to oppose it because free trade means you have to compete. And businesses would much rather be in a monopolistic position, obviously, than have to compete uh, to make money. Uh, the question at the end there uh, <clears throat> that I have on that slide, uh, is Trump overturning this globalization and the second round of globalization that we had following the uh, uh, World War II? That's the big question. Uh, <clears throat> without going into detail, um, globalization, which I'm equating somewhat with free trade here, uh, I think has been positive. It's been good for us. Again, a busy slide that... <clears throat> Um, last year was the 200th anniversary, 200 year anniversary of David Ricardo's publication uh, of his work that established the concept of comparative advantage, which remains the basic theoretical foundation from free, uh, for free trade. Economics, keep in mind, is about efficiency. And what uh, Ricardo was able to show is that <clears throat> if um, trade impediments are put in place, it distorts investment. It uh, results in higher cost and uh, a greater inefficiency. And that um, uh, foundation has remained uh, the basic foundation of why we engage in trade. But we should point something out uh, on that. The benefits are measured in the aggregate. And when changes occur, when shifts in the global economy occur, there are not just winners, there are winners and losers. Schumpeter's famed creative destruction concept. Not everybody uh, wins out. When we look at uh, the benefits of globalization, we tend to look at them overall, how the entire world has benefited. But clearly, there have been losers. And as I'll come to very quickly, uh, <clears throat> some of the losers who have been hurt by globalization, been hurt by NAFTA, um, were able to exercise political activity, and uh, a result was the election of Donald Trump in one uh, uh, sense. Uh, <clears throat> if we put that into context, I'm one of those who believe you cannot separate on a global scale economic activity and economic outcomes from political outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> both of those are very real academic disciplines. They tend to stay within their own lanes. But in reality, each has an effect on the other, as we know. If we look at American foreign policy, and this is an egregious simplification, uh, <clears throat> some major schools, liberal internationalists, 
those have been individuals who have seen free trade as good for America and good for the world. Uh, going back to uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was an academic, the first American to obtain a PhD in history. He uh, was at Princeton. He was president of Princeton University. And <clears throat> he became an accidental president in 1912. And <clears throat> he pushed for, um, with the uh, uh, horrors of World War I, he pushed for the creation of a platform, uh, <clears throat> the League of Nations, that would minimize war by creating benefits of nations working with one another, both politically and economically. That foundation was uh, picked up by Franklin D. Roosevelt and by many post-World War II politicians, especially Democrats. Not all Democrats. Labor has not been on board for a lot of it. Uh, the next school there, the realists, the ones that say that <clears throat> it's a messy world out there. It's all about power. It's all about gaining an advantage. And um, uh, we have to be aware of that, that when we look at traditional issues that America has uh, been pushing, like human rights issues, the view is that those are secondary. What counts is power. We shouldn't get sidetracked on to such things as women's rights, human rights, immigration issues. It's all about maintaining power. Uh, the question I have at the end of that um, is, uh, is that Donald Trump's view? And I've got a question on it. The last one, the neoconservative group, um, they became uh, interesting in the 1970s and 80s. And we as a nation became uh, aware of them uh, under uh, George W. because much of his international policy was led by neoconservatives, uh, the ones who believed that uh, uh, the, uh, it was the role of the United States to serve as an enforcer, an enforcer for our view of, uh, of democracy, our view of free markets. And we should take action to make sure that that happens. Is Trump one of those? Um, the question then, <clears throat> um, will the real Donald Trump stand up? Is he a protectionist or is, does he support a free trade regime? His views have been um, on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> when Trump was beginning to speak out on issues of uh, international policy and national policy in the 1980s, he was extremely critical of Ronald Reagan, pointing out that our trade policies, in his view, were going to hurt America. He was opposed to those. He also was opposed to American involvement in the Middle East wars. He uh, very specifically stated that these were issues that were draining America uh, financially, and uh, we were seeing no benefit from that. <clears throat> Does he support free trade? Uh, his views tend to, again, be all over the map on that. Um, what he did say in his presidential campaign, and keep in mind, Trump seems to have a thing for fulfilling uh, the, um, the, the statements that he made during the campaign. Uh, we're, quote, we're getting ripped off in trade. Every nation takes advantage of us. This will stop with me. We will, quote, put America first. Um, said that in the inaugural uh, address, and he has spoken uh, a lot about economic nationalism. The role of America in the world is to protect America, not to uh, make it a better world uh, economically. Secondly, we'll build the wall. Mexico, our third largest trade partner, we'll block that off. Uh, <clears throat> um, we'll renegotiate NAFTA and other bad treaties, and that'll result in beautiful bilateral trade deals, as I just pointed out, and many of you are aware of. Uh, and NAFTA with Mexico is being renegotiated today. Uh, <clears throat> we will not participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and one of the very first things that Trump did when he took office in January of 2017 was to uh, abrogate the TPP. Uh, we'll impose a 45% tariff on imported goods from China, name the, uh, uh, China as a currency manipulator. Uh, he has not followed through on that <clears throat> specifically. Um, Quote, we will unwind international supply chains of U.S. firms and repatriate their factories and jobs. This came from Peter Navarro, uh, who uh, was a professor of economics at UC Irvine and who is perhaps the most hawkish of Trump's China uh, advisors. Uh, 
Uh, we'll see where that goes. It's, uh, Mnuchin, uh, our Secretary of the Treasury, has been pushing back on this. Uh, so far, that has not occurred. And we'll reform tax policies to uh, create job growth in America. He's certainly done that. And uh, he will personally uh, tweet insults and demands for companies that don't uh, adhere to his own views on uh, what to do um, uh, in, about free trade. Uh, Finally, trade wars are good and easy to win, a comment that he made. So he's got some interesting views on that. Who's calling the shots on free trade on international economy in the Trump administration? Uh, it, it remains to be seen because a number of people have been speaking out. Robert Lighthizer, who is the US Special Trade Rep, has certainly been hawkish. Uh, Peter Navarro, who I just mentioned, has been a super hawk on that. Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, has been more on Navarro's side. On the other side, uh, Mnuchin, Secretary of Treasury, the ex very senior partner at um, Goldman Sachs, has been more of a traditionalist on that, and according to some reports, has kept Trump from going over the edge in terms of adopting a very rigid economic nationalist policy. I would point out <clears throat> that on this, we don't know what goes on in the mind of Donald Trump. Uh, we see statements, but the, again, the degree of contradiction is such that it's hard to pinpoint what he really wants. Uh, I will say this, that I think Donald Trump does believe in the United States, that uh, he wants to make it a stronger economy. But you want that, I want that, we all in America want that. But it's a question, I think, of means and ends. Uh, on the um, pro side, um, uh, uh, Ken Fisher, who is a um, stock picker of sorts, he, had, he has written, quote, he's uh, uh, planful and sly like a fox. Of all politicians, uh, Trump's the most skilled I've ever seen at head fakes. His classic negotiating tactic, perfected by the master of the art of the deal. Is that what we're seeing? A lot of these statements are simply to improve the ability to negotiate his one-on-one -on -one, uh, deals. Uh, on the negative side, and this is my view, there is no strategy there. His outbursts are simply ad hoc attacks driven by the moment, ungrounded in any sense of economic or uh, historical political reality. And if implemented in uh, many of his comments, it would put us on a collision course with our trade partners, certainly in Europe, uh, in China, uh, in Canada. And it would do great harm both to our domestic economy as well as the global economy. And, and I'm not overstating this, I think, it could lead to serious damage uh, called a war. That has happened in the past, and it's one reason why the United States adopted trade policies that wanted to push global discussion, global forums to talk about trade, because they were instrumental in the outbreak of World War I. Um, a lot of uh, places to watch uh, in terms of trade policy today. Clearly, the United States, the red circles are there. Uh, the big one up there, uh, um, two big ones, uh, Soviet Union, uh, pardon me, uh, Russia, uh, and China. Then uh, Brexit coming up, Brazil uh, still has some issues. Uh, <clears throat> East Africa, where it's becoming uh, uh, militarily hot. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in the Middle East remains a problem, North Korea uh, and uh, Japan. Issues all over the place. If we focus on China, uh, on that, um, <clears throat> China certainly has benefited from America's policies on trade. Um, <clears throat> when Deng Xiaoping, who really is the creator of modern China, Mao was a revolutionary, Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978 and really uh, pushed for economic development. Uh, <clears throat> when he was the one who created <clears throat> the special economic zones that essentially invited uh, foreign economy, economic actors to come to China and to take advantage of the absurdly low labor rates that prevailed at the time. The first uh, SEZ special economic zone was in Shenzhen uh, uh, near Hong Kong below uh, Guangzhou, and it proved to be a masterstroke. China began to boom. Uh, and as those special economic zones were expanded, China became the workshop of the world. In the 1980s, it was getting traction. In the 1990s, it was beginning to grow. 
and in the aughts, uh, uh, from more or less 2000, 2010, the Chinese economy just boomed. I am one of those who look back on that period, and I do think China was not playing by the rules. I think they were manipulating currency in order to make Chinese goods uh, cheap in world markets, and they were also uh, exercising uh, domestic controls to inhibit uh, uh, foreign products from coming in and competing with certain American products. They were manipulating currency and they were uh, taking advantage of open markets. <clears throat> um, there, and as I think there's no doubt about it, they were also ripping off uh, IP, America's as well as uh, European intellectual property, uh, absurdly so, in your face so, in many respects. The economy was growing though, and as China became a switch from being a market where you could go to get cheap labor to becoming a market of hundreds of millions of consumers, American firms proved somewhat willing to go along with the game in order to get access uh, to those markets. Under Hu Jintao, the um, uh, president of China for his uh, uh, two five-year terms during that time, um, the Chinese economy boomed massively, and American firms were able to take advantage of that. You go back to one of those earlier slides I had, large American firms went in there. You look at Apple, you look at General Motors, you look at Starbucks, uh, the list goes on and on of large American firms benefited tremendously by having access to that market. When Hu Jintao <clears throat> stepped down after his uh, uh, two five-year terms, Xi Jinping became the president. Xi Jinping, as most of you I'm sure are aware, has established himself as the core leader, as uh, he's being called, as a president for life. Uh, <clears throat> he seems to have abandoned many of the constraints that Deng Xiaoping had put on the, um, the presidency of China. Uh, uh, who, uh, she, uh, Deng Xiaoping said essentially, keep your head down, don't take an active role, uh, in the world yet, we're not, we don't have the power to do so. Xi Jinping is doing that. <clears throat> um, he's doing a lot of things that pushing his uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, pushing his China 2025 initiatives where he has de designated 10 industries of the future in which he says China will dominate the world, a lot of critical industries. These push directly against America's strengths. Uh, <clears throat> I think I am one, I would give uh, Trump credit for pushing back on China on some of these issues. Uh, I do think that George W. Bush was essentially unaware of what was going on then, uh, this massive boom. And I think Obama was too lenient. Obama said things, but he didn't follow up, uh, certainly on the militarization of the uh, Spratleys of the South China Sea Islands and of the um, violations of uh, uh, intellectual property, manipulation of currency, and other issues. So I'll give Trump credit for that. I think it was a corrective that had to be done. But the issue, um, are, do we want to push back hard? Do we want to um, use whatever term we want, destroy China's economy? Uh, the short answer for every one of us should be no. We want to work something out that's beneficial to all. And I think this is where we lead to some very serious problems. One of the things that I think Trump is unaware of, <clears throat> or not sufficiently aware of, is the history, the modern history of China, the so-called century of humiliation, starting in the 1840s, when the European powers essentially moved in took over China, did whatever they wanted. Japan then came in. But in that century of humiliation, um, pride ended in uh, 1911 when the last emperor was thrown out and the Republic of China was created. But China was weak. And that's a, an historical fact that every single person in China is more than aware of. They are not going to be pushed around by foreign powers again. Having over a century of that was indelibly branded in the consciousness of China. And I think that today, if um, Trump is pushing Xi, um, Xi Jinping into a corner, it won't end well. It, it, it can't end well. Xi Jinping cannot publicly back down and made to, be look like, made to look like uh, a vassal in front of Trump. Trump 
brings an attitude of um, <clears throat> transaction is that he tends to see the world as a zero-sum game. If somebody else is doing well, then somebody else must be losing. If China's doing well in trade, then the U.S. must be losing. We have to push them back. The world, <clears throat> when World War II ended, the United States broke out of its long history of isolationism and finally took a role in creating the modern world order in which um, cooler heads prevailed. Forms were created in order to work out issues before resorting to the worst uh, ultimate uh, answer, which is war. And the benefit has been we've essentially had peace in that time. Obviously, we've had issues. We had uh, Korea, we had Vietnam, we had uh, the issues going on in the Middle East, we had Kosovo, but we have not had the massive conflagrations that characterize the world for much of our history, and that is beneficial. Uh, the last thing I think any of us want to do is create a situation where trade ends up in war. Uh, how do we deal with China? I think we, um, we talk about it, we be tough, we establish positions, but we don't threaten, we don't put the other side in a position, we box them into a corner where the only reaction is they have to take a tit for tat retali retaliatory effect in order to maintain face. I think we all lose in that respect. Um, <clears throat> politics, economics, globalization, I'm just going over these fast. I wanna leave time for your uh, questions if there are any. I will um, <clears throat> come to somewhat of a conclusion with this. Um, a broader context of all of this discussion is that <clears throat> one of America's famed entrepreneurs, Henry Luce, the uh, creator of the time, co-creator of the Time Life Publishing Empire, in 1941, he wrote an essay <clears throat> in Time Magazine, which became a touchstone for much of the 20th uh, century after that. <clears throat> he coined the term the American century. Uh, he pointed out that in the United States, and he was quite prescient in his uh, perspective that the United States finally was going to play a dominant role in the world. <clears throat> and the uh, 20th century, whether you hate America, whether you love it, or whether you're totally indifferent, was the 20th century, was the American century. Uh, we simply uh, dominated. But something to keep in mind, those of you, your Physics 101 class, what goes up must come down. History is not science. But history does have some interesting lessons, such as they are. Uh, I should point out, by the way, when I say that, Antonio Gramsci, a, um, a, a, a Italian theorist, political and somewhat economic theorist, pointed out uh, history has lessons, but unfortunately it tends to have no pupils. But aside from that, if we look at our modern history for dummies, the first modern nation state <clears throat> was um, Spain. Uh, leveraged uh, Portuguese navigational technology, found the new world, created an empire, couldn't maintain it. 17th century, Holland developed this little nation, uh, uh, tremendous trading skills, built up an empire, New Amsterdam, read New York, New Holland, read uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Dutch East Indies, uh, Indonesia, huge empire, couldn't maintain it. 18th century, France dominated, couldn't maintain it. 19th century, the greatest uh, empire in history, uh, the United Kingdom, couldn't maintain it. Um, it's a little sad when you look at this, is that no nation has dominated over time. And that's a question that has um, been the subject of study by historians, philosophers, economists, about everybody for a long time. When we look at that, is the 21st century going to be the Chinese century? Is it inevitable that this nation that is four times larger than America in population and whose economy essentially on an aggregate basis is as large as America, certainly not per capita income, we're about uh, uh, four to five times more per capita, but in the aggregate, <clears throat> it's a rich nation. Um, I teach there every summer, came back a couple weeks ago, uh, this time in Beijing, and every time uh, I go there, um, I continue to be amazed by the incredible wealth that's there. Um, I believe in my country, I'm an American. Uh, I want us to continue to do well. Uh, I have predicted for the last 15 years that China cannot sustain this uh, a level of development and at the end of every year, I'm forced to eat my words. <clears throat> Is China 
um, simply going to dominate from sheer size. Uh, <clears throat> and the United States has to reconcile itself to that and find our own strengths, or is Trump fighting a rear guard action trying to do something that will perhaps artificially create American hegemony going into the, uh, this interesting young century in which we are uh, lucky to participate? Um, that remains the question. So <clears throat> where do we end this? Um, one world or a collection of countries? Uh, one world pursuing global trade policies, pursuing an agenda that seeks global peace, not in your face, uh, I'm better than you, mine is bigger than yours, let's duke it out and see who wins? Or is it one where we can continue the uh, post-World War II policies created by the United States to create a better world for everybody who lives in it? Um, let me end with a few conclusions on this. Uh, I'm kind of busy and I'll uh, just read the highlights. Um, one, <clears throat> economic strength almost always correlates with global political and military power. That simply is an historical fact. We have to be aware of that. Economic nationalism, <clears throat> a win-lose game, which I think yields only pyrrhic victories, and almost always uh, economic nationalism had resulted in dire consequences, uh, and if you push that, it means war, uh, that it has not been good. Uh, three, cross-border trade is not a zero-sum game. Uh, <clears throat> globalization has succeeded economically. But <clears throat> uh, again, as I uh, mentioned a moment ago, the benefits were not evenly distributed. In the aggregate, it has worked. But we have some very real problems today with the elite. If you're watching this, you're part of the elite. I'm part of the elite. We have done very well from globalization. But those who have suffered from it, and as the data shows convincingly, those who have suffered have not suffered so much from Chinese imports as they have from uh, automation and substitution of capital for labor in American factories. But they have suffered, and nobody uh, uh, really paid that much attention to them. We talked about it, but did nothing. Uh, an analogy that's been used by others, if you're drowning in the ocean, you don't care who throws you a life buoy, and you don't question, is it sincere? Trump threw a life buoy in his election. I don't think he was sincere. I think his policies have shown that. But those who grabbed it said, my God, somebody finally seemed to be paying attention to me. That's an issue we have yet to deal with. How do we distribute the benefits of globalization, not just to those of us who have received them, but to others? Uh, we've had trouble doing that. And a lot of it is a very complex issue. A lot of it has to do with politics in Washington, a refusal to spend on programs to really bring about training or outright subsidies from those who've suffered and will never be able to regain something. Uh, it's an issue. Um, uh, the existing multi multilateral trade system uh, is beneficial. Uh, Trump wants to undo that. He loves bilateral deals, one-on-one, -on -one where his supposed skill in negotiating can come to the fore. That's a skill, by the way, that's celebrated in a book far more than it was in reality. But in 1934, the United States began to push for a multilateral trade regime. The reason was that the reason was because when we had bilateral trade deals, it was a bullying sort of outcome. One nation could use its power. But multilateral meant everybody had to get the same benefit. And it resulted in everybody agreeing to the rules. The United States established the rule-based trade system after World War II. We benefited from that. We should not abandon it. We should not revert to a bilateral system similar to what Trump is doing with Mexico, what he wants to do with Canada, what he wants to do with the EU, what he wants to do with China. China violated rules, I think, uh, but there are ways to bring them into compliance without pounding them uh, over the head and pushing Xi Jinping into a corner in which fighting is the only way for him to uh, save his own face uh, with that. Uh, and finally, um, one that I haven't talked about at all, and I have no answer, um, and it's part of the entire issue is uh, immigration policy. I think one thing we did see with the election in 2016 is that economic and political nationalism did not die with globalization, that we are still a world of tribes.
and at some perhaps very visceral level, we identify with our own tribe. Much of the, um, the, the skill, the joy, the reality of America was creating mechanisms for the world to overcome those tribal instincts and find platforms to work out problems before they turn to uh, the, the terrible outcome of war. Um, but that doesn't mean that our sense of, of identity uh, simply uh, disappeared, that we saw ourselves as citizens of the world. We still see ourselves as citizens of a country. And when one feels that his or her country is being pummeled and being overtaken by alien forces, it brings out a, um, a feeling that people don't like that. And what we've seen in Europe, what we're seeing now, what we're uh, uh, certainly seeing in parts of uh, uh, Asia, and what we've classically seen in the United States is an appeal to the worst side of our nature. Uh, politicians using that as a ramp to get elected, uh, trying to appeal to the sense of, uh, of we have to protect ourselves from the quote unquote other. Um, I don't have an answer to it. Um, I think it can be worked out long term, but it takes education, it takes time. All right, <clears throat> I've made a lot of comments. Uh, hopefully there are some questions out there. Uh, <clears throat> what's Trump's uh, view on global trade? Uh, I, I'm as confused as you are. Uh, uh, where do we go from here? So if there are questions out there, um, <clears throat> let me know. And um, <clears throat> if not, I'll blather on. Uh, and I think we've got 15, 20 minutes or so. <clears throat> while you're composing your brilliant uh, little thing. Um, you can submit your questions. I think it's fairly clear how you do that, uh, sitting at your laptops, just key them in. And um, ask anything. <clears throat> I'll blather on here, uh, regardless of the issue. Uh, <clears throat> um, one thing I did not bring up, uh, while you're typing away there, I did not bring up um, uh, the special uh, prosecutor, uh, Mueller. Will that have an effect? Um, I think it might, obviously. But let me go back to where I started. The United States is not dependent uh, uh, nearly as much as other countries. Read Germany, for example, on global trade. Um, what if Mueller finds damning evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt that Trump was involved in collusion with uh, uh, Russia or anybody else, and that even though they wouldn't want to do it, the Republican House feels absolutely compelled to bring uh, uh, charges against him. Is that going to have a huge material effect on the American economy? Um, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, it hasn't in the past. It didn't with uh, um, Nixon. It did not with Clinton. We have a question from Chris. How China can be brought into compliance in terms of trade and treatment of intellectual property? <clears throat> there are rules, Chris. There are rules out there. As I said before, I think that uh, um, we as a nation, when George W. was in office, we weren't looking at it that closely. People were certainly aware of it. Bill Gates was making comments in the beginning of this century that maybe 90 to 95 percent of all Microsoft installations in China were illegal. So it's not as if we didn't know that. But I think on the business side, they were seduced by the massive economic opportunity of getting into China, and they were willing to give that up. Uh, <clears throat> we're far more aware of it today. The hacking that goes on that can be traced directly to the PLA, People Liberation Army, breaking into uh, uh, the sites of our firms and stealing intellectual property. And clearly, if you look at uh, Xi Jinping's China 2025 uh, outline, <clears throat> the industries, the 10 industries that he's targeted are ones that are rife with intellectual property that the United States created and that dominates. Okay, what do we do? <clears throat> we do have legal mechanisms. We have world courts and we have legal means to bring charges. They don't happen fast. So if any of you have ever been involved in a legal issue, the courts move slowly uh, uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> the question, can evidence be brought and force China to do something? I do think one of the benefits of uh, Trump's uh, uh, pounding on China is that China now were a charge brought and outcome clearly showed Chinese violation. It would be extremely difficult for China today to just brush it off. If you look what happened, for example, in the world court, 
on the uh, Spratly Islands, found that China had violated international norms by creating those artificial islands and militarizing them. China's reaction, and this was what, two and a half years ago, uh, three years ago, just said, essentially, screw you. We're not going to do anything. That court has no jurisdiction. The nine dash line, as it's called, uh, that was artificially created by China will remain in place. So <clears throat> what can we do? I think the high road, file the claims, take the action. And in today's environment, <clears throat> I think China is going to be under much greater pressure. And then escalate uh, uh, after that, <clears throat> if there is absolute uh, indication that China continues to violate. I will say this, I think China is trying to clean it up. They're more than aware of these issues. And the government <clears throat> at the senior level has indicated they have to fix things. Hasn't been perfect, but it is uh, moving along. Um, uh, uh, from Siddhartha, if China is forced to devalue the currency ne to negate the tariffs, how can, um, what's the rest of that question there? Um, how, how can China be brought into compliance? I can't, what if they're, the, you know, how can we uh, handle it if they're uh, if forced to devalue the currency? Uh, <clears throat> well, the only way to force that, China's currency is not convertible. The RMB, the value is established by the government. It was fixed for a long time and obviously was set at 8.27 to the dollar uh, up till about 2007 or eight. It clearly was a uh, value that made Chinese goods cheap in world markets. Under pressure, China at the time, when Paulson was Secretary of Treasury, the last part of George W's second term, he said, you gotta do something. China said, okay, you're right, we give up. 8.11, uh, well, that was nothing. They then had to move to a, um, a, uh, a managed basket of currencies, where they are now. The, um, <clears throat> at the time, Back then, <clears throat> many economists who look at this closely, you take somebody like our ex-dean Rich Lyons, whose uh, uh, major uh, uh, academic expertise is currency evaluations. People like Rich uh, were saying that if China's currency uh, uh, were floated, it would probably double in value to four to the dollar. It was that bad, the way it was being manipulated. Well, <clears throat> with the float, with the uh, managed float, as it were, the currency did drop to, it got under six for a while, down to five, nine for a while, still moving down. <clears throat> but other factors, economic factors, have pushed back up. Today it's trading at about, what, six, seven in that neighborhood, maybe moving up. Is that real? Um, the, it, it's hard to tell. Any economic statistics that come from a government agency in China have to be looked at with a degree of suspicion. Uh, they have been politicized. They're, uh, still, it's a problem of simply the skill and expertise to collect data, as well as the burnishing of the data to uh, achieve um, um, political goals. Um, but the basic question then, um, uh, if China is forced to devalue, uh, 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 can we handle it? <clears throat> uh, if they were to, they, they, they can't devalue anymore, it's going. They would revalue, they would drive up price. Uh, <clears throat> would it hurt? Well, uh, imports from China would go up in, in price, that's uh, certainly true. Uh, <clears throat> and it would put some pressure on China. China has been moving upscale. I think too many people still look at China and say, cheap goods. Um, a little 30 second piece of history here. Go back to the 1950s, a Japanese junk. It was crap, everybody knew that, but they improved. In the 1970s into the 80s, Korean crap. Then Hyundai, Samsung got a lot better. Too many people today still associate Chinese goods with very poor quality. It is getting better. China is trying to move up market in terms of quality, in terms of value added. So that in itself is going to force them to change on that. Question from Sherman, in my opinion, what are the key elements of a good economic policy? And do you see any politician of either party who understands and could rise in influence? Uh, great question, Sherman, and um, good economic policy. Uh, I do believe in markets, uh, but as I tried to indicate, markets, if you leave it to business people, if, if any of you have ever suffer, suffered through reading anything from Adam Smith, and believe me, if you ever can't sleep, pick out his book 
look at one page at random and you'll be out like a light in a minute. But maybe the single most prescient line in there, one of the five books, and I'll paraphrase what Smith said, whenever you see two or more business people quietly talking in the corner of a room, you know they're trying to fix the market to their benefit one way or another. Business is about making profit. It's about profit. It's not about efficiency. It's not about free trade. It's about how can we make profit. In that context, the economic values that economists have generated, not only David Ricardo and Adam Smith, but so many others, have been arguments to make the playing field level, to focus on efficiency, to have a rule-based system. So good economic policy, good elements, are individuals who espouse that. The last part of Sherman's question, um, I, I, I get worried when I think about that, but I'm convinced somebody's out there, Sherman. Uh, somebody's out there. <clears throat> let me use one example. I'm not using this politically. In fact, let me give two. Before Obama, got elected. Go back, uh, what, a year before? He did the talk in 2004, but he was an unknown. He popped out. Um, <clears throat> look at uh, Donald Trump. What's my point here? Somebody's out there. We have a huge nation. There's so much talent in this country. I think somebody's out there. I personally, I don't like any of the names who are now being bandied about as potential on either Republican or Democratic side, but some of them I don't know well enough. But I want to believe somebody's out there. Crummy answer, Sherman, to a very good question. Uh, uh, Yanni, what can the U.S. do to avoid bullying behavior of these uh, bilateral agreements other than to engage in multilateral? Are there other alternatives? Uh, <clears throat> great question again. <clears throat> if I were to read Trump at putting a, a positive spin on it, going back to that Ken Fisher quote, he's simply playing a game to win a negotiating advantage. He's playing the tough guy, good cop, bad cop, in order <clears throat> to bring the other side to the table in an honest way. Now, I personally, as I think I indicated, I don't believe that. But is that one way? China, I think, is aware critically now that its violation of internationally recognized trade policies cannot go on. And we're not the only country, by the way, Yanni. Uh, uh, Europe has pushed back a lot. If you look what Germany's doing in many respects now, you look what Italy has been doing, many other countries, South America even to a degree, we've suffered from China's policies. China is aware of that, and I think they're realizing they have to do something better. They have to play by rules. The spotlight is very bright. Uh, uh, Jian Ping, to expand on Chris's question, China has a systematic way of making the playground a bit unfair for international companies. They have to find a local partner, transfer technology, the law in China that's been practicing for decades. Key reason behind it is trade market. Chinese to make the market for technology. How do you negotiate with that? Um, Jianping, I take it from your name. You do have some uh, familiarity uh, with the system. <clears throat> um, China did require a partner until the, uh, uh, when they joined the WTO under uh, Clinton. By the way, sidebar here, uh, I think Clinton historically is going to suffer from his views on allowing China to join. <clears throat> but aside from that, uh, <clears throat> the, when that went into place, the uh, firms were allowed to create so-called WUFIs, wholly owned foreign entities. A foreign firm does not have to have a Chinese partner now. But in key areas, obviously, they have to. One example, in fact, it's been in the news for unfortunate reasons just the other day, uh, yesterday, was Didi. Um, Uber did not leave China on its own volition. Uh, uh, Uber was pushed by the government to cut a deal with Didi. And the deal uh, uh, with Didi is the Uber of China. The deal gave huge benefits to Didi. What is Uber's real official name? Uber Technologies. China wanted to ensure that technologies would be under the dominion of Chinese firms. Uh, if uh, the people I talk to who use uh, uh, on-call uh, 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 taxi service in China, they say Didi was so much uh, uh, less good if there's such a kind. They were so much worse than Uber. They loved Uber, and, and I think that's an issue. So I think your point, Jianping, about that being the Chinese way. Can we do anything about it? I do think that China is becoming 
more of a player. Let me add one little context here again. When the United States, at the end of World War II, finally played a, a role in the world, we had had essentially no experience in the world. We were an isolationist nation, the greatest generation, quote unquote, if you want to call it that, uh, <clears throat> where we came in and we did things. China's leadership has not been uh, uh, active in the world. Um, can they establish capabilities? Uh, one would hope so. Many of the top leaders have been educated in the West. They bring that education with them. I don't think we should see China in a static concept. We should see it as develop, developmental. We should see it as dynamic. I'm not an apologist for China by any means. I think China, uh, I think we have to find some way to make China, quote unquote, pay for what they did, some reparations or something. I haven't in my own mind thought through what to do. But China ripped off the system for its own benefit. Some price has to be paid. But the destruction of the global economy is not the price you want, I want, or any of us should want. Um, 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 Kimberly, uh, what forecast scenario can be shared with the administration to present the case for globalized free trade that demonstrates that it is not a zero-sum game? Uh, I think we've just got to rely on, uh, on, on good economists. Um, Mnuchin's not an economist, but certainly his background at um, <clears throat> Goldman, which has benefited hugely from globalization, pushing for that. Navarro, I think Navarro is wrong. Peter Navarro, who thinks that China ought to be ground into dust. I don't know his views on that. I don't know the origins of them. His Death by China video, sponsored by who, by the way, Nucor Steel, who is a huge beneficiary of putting up barriers to importing of China steel. I think he's, he's wrong. Uh, <clears throat> I think that we have to rely on good economic theory and policy to do what we're doing on that. Uh, Philippe, most of our debt is being held by China. How does it, should that influence our government strategy? Um, yes, it is. Uh, China and um, Japan. And both, interestingly, and I think you're aware, Philippe, and many of you out there are aware, for the same reason, is that they bought the debt in order to not see their currency uh, 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 appreciate. <clears throat> that. Uh, uh, we would buy things, they'd get the money, they'd immediately buy U.S. Treasuries, T-bills, in order to avoid uh, their currency appreciating dramatically. And then we, of course, took the money, sent it to the Middle East, and destroyed it. But in that context, um, what can we do uh, 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 about that? Uh, the question, most of our debt is being held. Do they hold a cudgel over our head? Yes. But talk about MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. The last thing that China would want to do is destroy the huge amount of, uh, of American-held debt to destroy their own holdings of that. It, it's simply, maybe North Korea would do it. Xi Jinping and his econom economic advisors wouldn't. Uh, they are not that irrational. It's an issue that I think is more telling in theory than in reality. Oh, yes, it could be done, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Martha. Uh, Global Trade Magazine notes that in two, uh, 2016, the U.S. provided only uh, one half of 1% of new short-term official export credit working capital. China has invested more in short-term. Yeah, should we change that? Um, China has been an export-led economy. That uh, exports as a percentage of GDP is still about 40% in China. They're trying to transition to domestic consumption. The United States, about 70% of our GDP uh, is driven by personal consumption. For the major OECD countries, it's in the mid to high 50s, almost 60%. China's personal consumption is still only in the mid 30%. They're trying to move into that under pressure to not manipulate export markets, currency, etc., trade rules for their own benefit. They're trying to do that. It's beginning to take place. If you've been to China recently, it really is interesting. The millennials in China are pigging out at the trowel like we are. They are buying things on credit. They're getting a lot of stuff. A lot of my older Chinese friends, they look at it and they say, our kids are not like us. We had to work hard, darn it. We had to really do a lot of effort. And the kids are just, we give them money and they immediately want to buy fancy cars and go to best restaurants and buy the latest Uniqlo clothes and everything else. So in that context, I think China will be consuming more. I think that is going to address some of uh, Martha's uh, questions on that, that uh, it, it won't, it'll, it'll resolve itself. 
Uh, Brad, what is a good resolution to the trade war with China? I know the ratio of tariffs, 2% for China imports, China exports uh, uh, to uh, China, 22%. What would the best case scenario be? Um, <clears throat> again, China's exports, get, keep in mind the headline figures that Trump talks about are merchandise trade uh, 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 deficit, 500 billion. That doesn't take into account services. That China has said they're going to open up services more, especially financial services. We do a lot better in that. <clears throat> uh, when I go and teach in China, I bring home money that contributes to our benefit because it's a service. It's China's not exporting a physical good that they are importing in IP, intellectual property, for myself and others. <clears throat> in that context, I think that a good resolution to the trade war is to continue what the more level-headed minds in the Trump administration, and admittedly, that's not a lot of people, uh, are, are pushing for. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, China is getting the message, I think, and getting it clearly, and its egregious violations of trade policy simply aren't going to stand. And again, let me repeat this now for the third time. Putting a positive spin on Trump, perhaps some of his bullying, call it whatever, his inconsistency has pushed China to that. So I'll give him credit for that. I don't think it was by plan. I think it's just who he is. He just sputters out there, tweets out, and something happened. But we're seeing a benefit from that. And I would add something else on this. Xi Jinping is in trouble to a degree. Xi Jinping put a lot of, uh, of, of um, his, his um, reputation behind being able to manage Trump. He hasn't been able to do that. China, what we see is on the surface. It is incredibly rich, complex underpinning to that. Not everybody is happy with Xi Jinping establish himself as president for life as the core leader. There were a lot of very ambitious politicians. Keep in mind the China policy. Five years elected by the Politburo, another five years more or less automatically in and out. Well, many who were the leadership alone, Xi Jinping is about 65 years of age. They no longer have a future. They're not happy. They're not happy at all. Without going into details, there have been stories that Xi Jinping's life has been in danger somewhat because of this, that people have been unhappy with him. Xi Jinping has been pushed on his back foot by some of what's going on. And I think the outcome of that is that the need for China to play by the rules. This is why the dis what Trump has talked about, dismantling the WTO, minimizing uh, uh, the European relationship with the, uh, so many of these mechanisms have been so beneficial. The major reason why these mechanisms were created in post-World War II, and keep in mind the US did this, the United Nations, the, G, uh, the GATT, which is now the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, the BISF, the um, Bretton Woods Agreement, they were to prevent another war. World War II, World War I didn't end. It was World War II, driven by the same policies. The world has benefited tremendously from those mechanisms. We want to maintain those. When trade turns into a fight, it is led to war. Nobody should want that. And I'm not sure that Trump is even aware of that uh, history. So one would hope that uh, uh, level minds that the Navarros of administration will be minimized. Lighthizer isn't, he's, he's apparently somewhat of a hawk, not as much as Navarro. Wilbur Ross is a business guy. All Wilbur Ross wants to do is make money out of his job. So I'm not sure what his views are. He was a steel guy. He'd love to see huge tariffs on, um, uh, on China, uh, steel and metal imports. So, so much for that. Um, I think we're, we're, uh, we're done. I appreciate your time. Um, I probably left a lot more questions than answers. Again, all of these PowerPoints, they're, they're yours to look at. And if you have any questions, send them to somebody and I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I'm off tonight to Asia again, so hopefully see you again. Thank you very much.